Have you ever wondered if your company is maximizing the return of your data investment? Are you collecting the right data required to make informed decisions? Is there more that can be learned from our data? Koyas Institute can answer these questions and help you discover the hidden value within your data sets by utilizing a well-rounded approach to data analysis. Stop leaving value behind and start increasing the return on your data investment. The next generation of data analysis has begun. We are pioneers in pattern discovery. We are Koyas Institute. Yeah, I'm trying to think when the last time we spoke, I think it was over a year and a half ago now. It's kind of going on a bit. Oh, at least. Uh, maybe more, actually. I don't even know. Was yeah. it? It was probably 20, 2020, wasn't it? Yeah, I think you were one of my uh, one of my first interviews, to be honest. Kind of yeah, like, I think so, too. Jumping onto the scene. So I know that you're actually going to be at a conference soon in your, uh, in your hometown, the one that's organized by Jay King and Kelly Chase, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not my hometown. I think I refer to it as my ancestral homeland. Right, right. Which okay. is, uh, just the whole state of Ohio. That's my home state. Uh, but I lived in a few different places around there. One of my best mates from college actually lives about five minutes from the base. Oh, yeah? They're having it, so, uh, I think a bunch of my college roommates are driving up for it, too, so should be pretty lit. I think Jay King, and I don't know if you've seen... Um, any of the uh, any of the kind of like videos from Jay King and James Ian Dolly's conferences in New York, the Inquire Anomalous conferences, really good. Like I really feel yeah. like this kind of fresh take on the UFO conference scene because you definitely got some that have some questionable speakers, and then it feels like there's like a, a more professional space being carved out in the last couple of years. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. No, I've been trying to lean more toward those and away from the the woo woo ones, but. I mean, they all serve a purpose. I, I think it's good they exist, and I'm glad that people put those on. But, yeah, I mean, like, I, I got invited to be a part of a group of 18 other PhDs at this uh, place called Esalen in Big Sur, California, oh, right on the coast. Uh, and found of Esalen because I— Yeah, you know. No, I think place. Terrence, Terrence McKenna's kind of like my spirit guide, so I know— Yeah, he spent quite a bit of time there, and oh, yeah. uh, Timothy Leary and, and all those fellas, but— yeah, it was it was cool. You know, it was, it was a good reminder that it doesn't have to just be like Alien Con or whatever the fuck Ancient Aliens is putting on at whatever given time. There's like, you know, people that that are are really talk, taking this stuff seriously that are in academia or industry. So, yeah, you know, there's not as many of those, which is great because it's kind of hard for me to leave home these days anyway. So I just kind of pick and choose and. Yeah, ones like that. I'm super excited about the one Kelly put together there in Ohio because, yeah, Jay's awesome and, and Darren, Exo Academia, and, you know, obviously everybody else is on the, the lineup too. Yeah, yeah. I was a big fan of the conferences in New York that I went to. Um, it's, it's funny, when I was speaking to uh, Jay and, and James, kind of like doing an interview talking about the conferences, I did say that it was it was reminiscent of Essel and it was reminiscent of that kind of... Oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, a space where you've got different types of ideas being put into the same kind of soup. Uh, so you have yeah. those and you have consciousness and you have other, other kind of takes on the subject, but they all kind of complement each other. And it was done in a way that was, you know, a little bit more uh, like kind of intellectually derived and, and kind of driven instead of just my anonymous source told me that the greys are doing this kind of, you know, it was a different type of flavor. And it was, it was something that I think that the subject needs. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm seeing more and more of that. So hopefully that continues. I'm, I'm excited where where we're going as a, as a community, as, you know, academics, all of it. It's exciting times. Yeah. Speaking of which, like, what do you make of the recent shoot downs over Alaska and Canada? I mean, they're, they're kind of treating these a little differently to the, to the Chinese balloon. Do you have any, any speculations on what you think might be happening there? Yeah, I mean, all we can do is speculate, but in my very uninformed opinion, it kind of seems like there's there's something going on, but we're not getting the whole story. And I think not getting the whole story is the most interesting part about it. There seems to be crosstalk between and among the different government agencies involved in this and, and the White House. So, yeah, I mean, all of those things seem to indicate that there 
they're trying to construct a narrative around it. I don't think they're exactly nailing it from what I can tell. Yeah. Or maybe that's part of you know, what they're trying to do. But it, it does seem, yeah, if, if they're just shooting down balloons, come out and say that. Why Why are they putting on this whole dog and pony show like they are with everything else? It, it almost seems like they're kind of testing the waters for yeah. what it might be like to try to give us more uh, little spoonfuls at a time. But I obviously have no idea. I haven't been following it super closely. It's just kind of my take from what I've uh, been seeing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, man. It's it's a weird one. There's people saying different things. Part of me wonders if it's just a distraction from other pressing events. I mean, for example, the poisonous cloud of noxious chemicals that's floating over Ohio in the... Uh, what? Uh, so, yeah, I forgot well, about it, that. Very low... Co- I mean, I haven't seen a single bit of news coverage in the UK on that event. And yeah. it's it, like a pretty catastrophic incident. It's devastating, I right? Know. Especially, you know, being an Ohio boy myself, you hate to see that happen anywhere, but especially where your friends live, you know, that's not a good thing to see. And I don't, I don't know what they're going to do about that. They're going to be cleaning that up for years if it's even possible. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, you always got to wonder when something's in the news that much if it's a distraction from something else. But I don't know. I think, I think it is genuinely an attempt at trying to convey something mm. uh, or at least prime the pump for something. Because I do get the sense that, that, that there are things on the horizon and they're going to need to start testing the waters with the media to see what they pick up on and what they can get across where and how it's reported because they all spin it different ways. I mean, how polarized we are as a, a nation, as a world. It's not just the U.S. But yeah, so I do kind of wonder if they're just testing their little sound bites across the airwaves to see what what comes out on the other end once it goes through the black box of the American medium. There's kind of a lot of people in in Congress and people in the Senate that are disgruntled over the whole way that this has been treated. I mean, there was a video I saw Senator Marco Rubio. uh, He had done this like little selfie video before he was going into a classified briefing saying that he didn't think that this should be classified and that you know, that this was uh, not being treated the way that they wanted it to be treated for the public. So it makes you wonder just what exactly is happening behind closed doors in these classified briefings and whether or not we're going to kind of see a little bit of spillover because leaks do happen and and they happen all the time. Yeah. No, I think they're inevitable, really. And especially when you have people on the inside that that want things to happen. I mean, how easy would it be for them to leak something? And and obviously Rubio has been on this for couple years now whenever that was at the Gillibrand amendment was yep. he a part of that or something around that same time I forget the details but yeah he, he was pushing the legislation for the whole kind of amendments for the uh for the new for the new intelligence act and all of that yeah that's what it was so yeah I mean not just him but there's a number of of senators and congress people that are seemingly pushing from the other side and you have us pulling from this side so between you know, those two inertial forces, hopefully we can get something to budge in the middle. Well, it definitely feels like there's, uh, you know, there's momentum happening. I mean, how do you feel about the way in which this has all been progressing from kind of like the governmental side? Because, you know, I I think, I think most of us would agree that there's a a very deep knowledge uh, and deep history of of secrecy and obfuscation and, and probably programs and things that not many people in government are actually made aware of. And so do you think that they're actually going to be able to crack open into some of these more, uh, you know, like the unacknowledged programs and the aerospace and the corporate world? Is it going to get that deep? Or do you think that it's going to be more just kind of like a surface level addressing of the issue and and kind of restarting the whole conversation without going too deep in what, you know, into what they've already got in their closet? Yeah, I think it's going to be exactly what you just said. Right. Starting from the last thing you said, then moving back toward um, really acknowledging the long history of, of obfuscation, like you said. And and yeah, the, I mean, it's no secret. There's been all of these programs, Project Sign Grudge, Saucer, Blue Book, obviously. And, and I feel like, you know, it, I have been following this for really since I was a kid. I've been interested in it, but obviously dove in deep about 12 years ago and I started writing my first book on the subject. But yeah, the more you go down that rabbit hole, the more you see that they almost didn't even really try. Or or maybe just people were dumber back then. I don't know what it was. It was easier to pull the wool over their eyes. Sorry, Grandma, but, you know, y'all didn't do much to to push them, really. 
Um, so yeah, maybe, you know, maybe it's going to be more of the same, but I, I don't think so. It feels different this time. And, and honestly, I, I'm of the opinion, and I've, I've been saying this for a while now, that I don't, I don't think it's up to them, uh, the government or any of these agencies. I think it's ultimately up to the people coming here in these craft to decide when it's time for humanity to know. They've been here for thousands, tens of thousands of years, you could argue. And it does seem like we're approaching a point where we could finally wrap our heads around it. And, you know, not freak out as a society, like the whole Orson Welles thing. And right. it's not going to tank the economy. You know, maybe at first there'll be some disruptions. But if anything, I think it'll bring us together as as humans beyond anything else. All of these petty divides that we construct around the other, how we manufacture the other, I think those will eventually fade away. And clearly we're not at that point yet. We're highly polarized in many different capacities, but I, I get the sense that it's not coming from any, you know, majestic 12 type organization or the government of any one nation, but it's, it's the visitors themselves. And, and I do get the sense that it's time for them to reveal themselves and whatever capacity that may be, um, which is kind of exciting if that's the case. I mean, maybe I'm just, uh, hopelessly optimistic, but I, I do think that it feels it feels different. It kind of feels like we're moving in that direction. Well, you're uh, you're well known for your hypothesis surrounding the UFO issue in relation to the possibility that uh, some of these visitors are in fact humans from a point in future traveling back to our time for reasons that are, that are currently unknown. And um, for those who might not be too familiar with your work, would you just be able to explain? your perspective on this maybe it's changed a little bit but if not just explain your perspective on the ufo issue how it relates to in your opinion human evolution and uh, and the possibility of time travel yeah well i mean that was the first uh book i wrote just to kind of focus on um long-term evolutionary trends in in our hominin past and how if those continue into the future really regardless of whatever might happen between now and then, just based on these enduring trends in our craniofacial anatomy and our brain size, brain shape, um, our culture, our technological evolution. There's just a lot of things that seem to indicate that if we move forward in the future, which we're likely to do, we've been here six to eight million years as upright walking hominins, that we'll have bigger rounder heads, larger eyes, smaller faces, more advanced culture, and potentially even the capacity to achieve backward time travel. And there's nothing in the laws of physics that say it's forbidden. Uh, there's nothing that's keeping us from doing it other than our ability to develop the, the technology, the material sciences behind it in order to do that. So once we have the capacity to do it, uh, there's really nothing that's keeping us from not doing it. And, and as an anthropologist in particular, there's a lot of disciplines that would benefit from having that technology, but that's what we do as we study the past. And if we had the ability to get on one of these time disks and go back and examine our ancestors in person and collect tissue from them, collect fecal matter, uh, gametes from them, which is exactly what's described in the vast majority of these abduction reports, then we would, and we could learn so much more than just being left with the fossilized remnants of our ancestors' skeletal anatomy and their teeth. So we could learn about their culture, their belief system, their myths, their origin myths, their creation story, mores, folkways, all these things that are lost to time would then be available to us as researchers. And, and again, not just us. I mean, looking at the ecology of the earth, geology, we'd have um, so much more of an ability to understand those things. So I do think that their their physiological form, as it's described in the vast majority of cases, as being human, first of all, as uh, indicated by the results of the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Free study, and then the most common after that are the short grays and the tall grays, and then hybrids, and importantly, all four of those categories, human-like, short, tall gray, and hybrids, are all upright walking hominins, and that is the trait that defines the hominin lineage as being bipedal. So. The fact that we have so many homologous characteristics that we share with them, the fact that the craft seem to demonstrate the ability to manipulate space-time uh, and to defy time as we know it, if they have that ability, if they can you know, monitor the way we perceive them or how they perceive time within that craft to achieve these insane G-forces, these rapid accelerations and decelerations, which seems to indicate that they are manipulating the flow of time in and around those craft. 
And yeah, I think it explains a lot of this phenomenon. So that's that's kind of where I'm coming from. And, and yeah, in the last three years since I published my first book on it, I've had the opportunity to talk to a number of people in the physics community and industry and the intelligence community. And and really, there's been nothing that, that's thwarted this. And in fact, it's the opposite. I've just garnered more information from people that seemingly know a lot of things that are tangential, but complementary to how I've been investigating it. So it just, yeah, it continues to make more and more sense to me. And I think a lot of other people pay attention to the theory. Yeah, I think I think people outside of the UFO community at least have like a bit of a knee jerk reaction to the to the gray, the archetypal gray, because obviously it's it's a, it's a Hollywood symbol as well, right? It's kind of like the the typical alien. But I think the reason why it's the typical alien is because there's actually quite a few compelling cases of these types of beings. So, as someone who's looked into this specific type of uh, potential evolutionary path for humanity and seeing the greys as a comparable uh, species to us far far down the line through some sort of, you know, like series of evolutionary catalysts. What are some of the best cases for you of compelling testimony about experiencing alien greys? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and honestly, it was kind of a failing, well, I wouldn't call it a failing, it just wasn't the focus of my first book. I was more interested in really breaking down the anthropology, the physics, the astrobiology and the astronomy behind this theory and how it may stand in contrast to or complement the extraterrestrial hypothesis. And yeah, I was mostly focused on these archetypal greys. That's what started my deep dive into this was seeing Whitley Strieber's book cover communion when I was eight or nine years old. And then having this idea develop and then nurturing that through time. But then I realized shortly after I published that book, in fact, Ray Hernandez, uh, one of the editors of the the free study that I mentioned, the Dr. Edgar Mitchell uh, study, sent me his work. And, you know, I started to realize that the most commonly reported beings are human, entirely human, just like us. And and so I'd kind of been thinking of it in the context of really long-term evolutionary trends and tens of thousands of years in our future. And I do think these greys are likely coming back from 40, 50, maybe 60,000 years in the future. It would take at least that long for those characteristics to develop, even considering the accelerating rate at which they are changing throughout recent hominin evolution. But then I also realized that once we have this technology, what's stopping us from using it in the near term? And I think that can help explain a lot of the things that we see where very human individuals come out speaking all of the languages of this time and previous time. They're dressed similar to us. Their technology is similar, but more advanced, obviously. So to answer your question, there's a number of cases that I think indicate that. And that was more of the focus for my my last book called The Extra Tempestrial Model, where I looked across 90 years of time on five different continents, not just for ones that seem to indicate that they're time travelers. I also discussed the, the Betty and Barty Hill case because, you know, they claim to have been shown a star map. So we can't just throw that out. That would be selection bias, confirmation bias. So I looked at uh, 20 different case studies over this period of time and on five different continents and found quite a few really are just humans. And that was kind of a surprise to me because it's not something I considered in the first book. But um, there's one a case here in Montana, Udu Wartana. He was a Dutch miner that worked only about 50 or 60 miles from where I currently live in southwest Montana. Uh, Mike and Leo Dworshak was another famous case from... Uh, it took place in two different states around here and also in North Dakota. And the list goes on. I mean, Amy Rylance described her captors as being a you know, man with the exact same body proportions. It also indicates time travel. It's a really interesting case because she was picked up in one town, dropped off 790 kilometers later, but only 90 minutes after she was taken, which is obviously easy for a UFO to do. They travel very fast. But the part that's interesting about it is that she claims to have been on board this craft with this man and others for upwards of seven days, which indicates that in her frame of reference, she experienced almost a week of time. They brought her back in time to only about an hour and 90 minutes after she was taken, most likely because her husband was freaking out and her friend was freaking out because they saw her get taken, or at least her friend Petra did. So yeah, there's so many things that you start breaking it down where they, they seem to have these recurrent patterns. That was the main point of the book, is to look at patterns across these cases and to see what we can tease out of them. 
Um, but they seem to recurrently be human and, and they seem to have the ability to manipulate time and space in and around the craft itself. Yeah. So what do you think's up with the inherently human ones? Do you think that's just maybe us from slightly closer towards our timeline or is it actually yeah. from, you know, some covert group on, on the planet earth or? I think it's that and also the hybridization thing that's so commonly described. I think that's been going on for a very long time too. And if you think about it, and it's kind of the focus of a book I'm writing now that should be out in a couple months actually, is if you take these individuals at say even a, a more distant time, like the Greys, and you hybridize their DNA with past humans that lived maybe twenty, thirty thousand years before our time then you get something that's kind of a cross between them. You're averaging out those craniofacial characteristics and other aspects of their morphology and physiology. And and we have been accelerating our rate of change, but with the ability to travel back and sample gametes from any of these different forms, there's absolutely nothing that's stopping them from creating themselves just in a physical form that allows them to walk amongst us at whatever time they choose. And there does seem to be evidence that that's happening too, um, that they are actually here with us now in uh, whatever form, a human form, obviously, but with with the abilities, the clairvoyance, the telepathy, the future knowledge that you don't typically see in people of this time. So I think it's the hybridization. Uh, there are also people that report seeing, such as uh, Terry Lovelace described, instances of seeing modern humans in military garb, U.S. military garb, I think specifically, and he would know he was in the military. So that could be, you know, some sort of integration happening now that has been in the past. I know it starts to sound crazy and like conspiracy theory, but, you know, if, if we're working with them in the future, if we're working with them now, who knows when that started? We may have been for decades, really. Um, so, yeah, and then obviously the temporal ancestry thing, as I call it, where I think they're coming back from different times in the future. So the ones that look more like us are naturally closer to us in time. The ones that look less like us are probably from a more distant point in our evolutionary future. And it may even help explain the, the kind of bug-like mantid or reptilian forms described who, who may occupy a very, very distant point in our evolutionary future. So yeah, I think there's a lot of things going on and it's hard to really just say, you know, these visitors and talk about one group. Because I think if they are spread across time, we're dealing with different people with different intentions, with different reasons for being here, with different forms, different technology. And so, you know, we can look at the variation and, and look at patterns across that variation and maybe start to tease out what uh, we're being visited by most commonly. And and I, I was surprised to learn that they do tend to be humans, but then I'm kind of rambling on here. But one thing that occurred to me is that the same thing exists in archaeology. We have this sort of uh, sample bias where things that are closer to us in time, we see more often. Once you go farther back in time, you start talking about our very distant ancestors. Now you're less likely to find them. What you do find is more fragmentary. It's been destroyed by time itself and by animals pulling it apart and geologic forces moving it around. So it makes sense that we would see ourselves more simply because we are closer to this point in time uh, as we slowly move out into the future. So. Yeah, I think the fact that, you know, what they found in the free study, where it goes human, small gray, tall gray, hybrids, who knows, that could be a, a factor in all of them. But I do think it's an aspect of when they're coming back from. And I do think we're being visited by people generally closer to us in time because we're easier to find. The farther out you go, we just become one small blip on their radar in the vast expanse of time that separates us from them. Well, that makes sense. And you know, the hybridization is one of the, one of the interesting facets of the, of the UFO topic. And one of the people that I know and kind of introduced to the wider UFO community was John Ramirez, who's the G well, retired GS 15 CIA. And yeah, I just met him recently, actually. Oh, oh really? Yeah. What well, did you go to, uh, where he lives out in, uh, out in, uh, oh, Arizona? Uh, yeah, I did. I mean, not his house, but we were at the same conference. We were on a panel together nice. and, uh, we chatted for a little bit one-on-one -on -one after that. Yeah. I'd, I'd seen him on a couple, couple podcasts. It's, um, he's got some really, really interesting ideas and really, uh, yeah. Yeah. Really well articulated too. I'm, I'm uh, happy he joined the community cause uh, I think he's a, a valuable asset for sure. 
Absolutely. And, uh, you know, one of the things that he had said to me was that hybridization and implants were considered the most, uh, the most sensitive in terms of, uh, the CIA's involvement and interest in the UFO issue, hybridization and implants. And, uh, it does make you wonder. It makes you wonder. In fact, I remember actually, um, I think it was Terence McKenna. He was doing a, a, a conference, probably at Esalen or one of his many presentations where he was talking about the UFO subject, and I think he was actually in the same place as Jacques Vallée because he made reference to him a couple of times as if he was in the audience. So I imagine, yeah, yeah. And um, and he was saying about the implants. You know, they are uh, well to try and quote him. I think you know he said something like the implants. They're absurd. They're they're not necessary even at our level of technological development. So you you know you're talking about something of a of a much higher level of sophistication, and it's still having to put a piece of metal inside your body. Um, but there are some really compelling cases for implants. So it kind of makes you wonder yeah. who's using them. Why are they being used? You know, what's the story behind that? Have you got any thoughts on, have you explored implants much? Yeah, I have. Um, it, it came up a few times in, in some conversations I had in, in writing my, my most recent book. And and I actually just had a debate with someone about this a couple of days ago too, who has had experiences his whole life. And, you know, a lot of people who, who have interactions that involve telepathic communication naturally think, well, is this a part of my mind, my consciousness, or do I have something in my brain that allows me to receive and send information in this way? It was actually a, a big focus in my first book too. I looked at brain to brain communication and whether that may be an aspect of this and, and eventually came to the tentative conclusion uh, that it is an aspect of our consciousness. It's our minds. And I think that too is something that we're evolving. You know, it's easier to focus on these physiological characteristics like the big round heads, the big eyes, giant pupils, because those are memorable things, especially the eyes. But clearly they're, we as humans are moving toward a greater capacity for empathy, a greater capacity for um, you know, even clairvoyance, telepathy, and and you have certain individuals like like Joe McMonagall, Ingo Swan that you know can even do telekinesis and things like that. So, yeah, I, I definitely think it's an aspect of our future brain. Um, so I don't think the I don't think the implants are necessarily related to that. However. It, I mean, even just having a tracking device in someone, people do move around a lot. And, you know, Terry Lovelace thought that's exactly what his was for. He, he, I think, compared himself to an animal in the Serengeti being tracked by them. It would obviously save them a lot of time and effort if they just knew where to go. And, and again, it may be an aspect of what time they're part of. It, it seems like a more primitive thing to implant a hard microchip or whatever into a, someone as some sort of tracking device. But until they reach that point where we have this universal high of mind, this consciousness where they see all of our thoughts and know everything that we're thinking and doing at any given time, then that may be a necessity to find people. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that, it's kind of like I made an analogy, too, with uh, the way um, Calvin Parker and, and Charles Hickson were abducted in the Pascagoula case where they were actually injected with something to paralyze them. They were taken by these kind of robot-type android things but saw humans on the ship. So that all seems extremely primitive compared to just manipulating the abductees' consciousness to have them fall asleep, to give them UFO apathy, to give them screen memories, to give them amnesia so they don't remember it afterward. All of those seem to be characteristics of a more evolved human form where our consciousness has developed to the point that we can do those things. But, but prior to that consciousness evolution, that, that stage of development, I think you maybe have to rely on these more primitive means. Yeah, it's it's interesting, especially given where we're going. Um, just kind of thinking about your model and and what this potentially could be, because you know you look at both our technological innovation and also our integration as computational systems become more sophisticated and compact, and it would seem that we're not we're not that far away from a normalization of, of cyborgs, you know, of augmented human bodies with technological enhancements. And so I suppose I look at this, um, this kind of like biotechnological metamorphosis that's taking place. And I begin to wonder if this 
is the precursor towards becoming a species like the alien greys. And, uh, you know, although, although information's lacking other than, you know, some of these claims, and although there are some very good compelling cases, it would seem the greys certainly exist, at least in my opinion, they exist. Um, they've been reported too many times by too many individuals, and they seem to be capable of telepathic communication, which you mentioned. There are reports of them moving through walls as if they didn't. Mm -hmm. um, they often are believed to be mechanical or biomechanical and, and possibly a hive mind species, like you mentioned. Um, so I guess with all of your research in this area and um, everything that you've kind of like seen so far, when you look at where we're moving to with AI, with quantum computation, with virtual reality, do you feel like we're slowly becoming the greys? Is that how it feels to you? Yeah, it does. And, you know, I mean, there's obviously a lot of things that we just can't know yet. And I, I certainly don't claim to have any advanced knowledge coming from, you know, a source beyond what's currently available in our time. But yeah, if you look at enough of these cases and you look at what they're doing, you can kind of start to get a sense of how, because we're not just speculating about what we might do in the future. I mean, it's fun to do that, and we can obviously do that all day. But what we're trying to do is look through observational research at what they're doing, and then figure out who they are, why they're doing it, how they're doing it, all these questions that follow from that, all of the other W questions. So yeah, it's observational research, and you can look for patterns across those, ideally, We'd have a controlled environment. We'd set up cameras and all kinds of detectors. They're not idiots. They know when we do that, and they're not quite ready to be discovered in that capacity yet, clearly, because people have tried that with lifelong abductees and everything just kind of stops. Which actually is funny because a friend of mine and I decided that we should start a company where if you're sick of all of your abductions, you call us, kind of like Ghostbusters, put up all this equipment that makes the abduction stop and then, you know, pay us 10 bucks or whatever. It's not a great business model maybe, but it makes sense because if that is what's shutting down these operations, then, you know, why? But and it turns out most people enjoy them. 85% of people have a positive or benign experience according to the free study again. But, um, no, I, I, I do think that there's a lot going on with our consciousness. I think it maybe even is fundamental to this whole thing in some way. With that said, it's not the entire situation, because there is a, a very much a nuts and bolts component to this, so we have to recognize that too. Um, but as far as the mind, yeah, I mean, the, if that telepathic community, if, if consciousness is timeless, which it seems to be from near-death experiences, dreams, psychedelic hallucinations, where you know you can have this whole scene unfold, which feels like over the course of a day, and it may be 10 or 20 seconds. And, and we see similar things with UFOs in a nuts and bolts context, but also in the context of like DMT elves and, and the beans people have telepathic communication with once those barriers are shut down, or at least there's bridges that are formed between our consciousness and, and this potentially hive mind consciousness that exists that's clearly related to the UFO phenomenon, whether it be through almost dying or dreams or psychedelic trips or whatever. Um, and there's information that can be conveyed that way. So even if we're not talking about a physical craft, coming and picking someone up from the future or taking them to the past or getting past people, whatever, we can still conceptualize how information could easily move across time and space uh, simply through that process of, of consciousness communication. So, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of things we don't yet understand. We, we barely even talk about consciousness. It's another one of those taboo topics and, and has been for a really long time, as is UFOs. And maybe there's a reason behind that. Maybe it's all part of the same attempt to shut down our ability or, or willingness to talk about these things. But I, I do feel like that's changing too. And I think the more we examine consciousness, and especially in the context of UFOs and NDEs and psychedelics, I think we'll get closer to the answer on all of those things. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, this for me is such an integral part of the discussion. It's very, like you said, difficult to talk about because admittedly, I don't understand what consciousness is either. So I'm nobody does. Well, I'm grasping at straws when trying to explain, for example, my own experiences, which I truly believe involved a non local component of consciousness because, yeah. You know, the reason why my channel exists is because I had these experiences with orange orbs of light. And the reason why I saw these orange orbs of light is because I was out in my back garden 
getting into a, a basic meditative state and projecting the intention that I wanted to see something and something turned up. And I know how that sounds to a lot of people, but I, I don't care. I, I, I really experienced that. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I hadn't had that, that experience. Yes. And you're not alone. A lot of people oh, do. And, well, and yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention meditation because that's an important one too. Well, this is what I was happy to discover when I kind of dipped my toes into the UFO subject and found that actually I'm not alone. There's whole communities of people that are going out and doing that kind of stuff and having these kind of experiences. So consciousness is, is an absolutely integral, if not a keystone component of the UFO subject. It's one of the more difficult ones to kind of get our heads around because we're still, for the most part, in a Newtonian paradigm with science and a bit of a kind of like material reductionist paradigm in science. And that's changing, like you said, consciousness, psychedelic research, quantum computers, we're entering into a realm where things are getting a little bit more fluid and these kind of rigid systems are having to recalibrate and change because, and, and I truly do think the psychedelic research, and I'll, I'll shut up in a second and let you respond, but I really do think that psychedelic research is one of the um, kind of the unsung heroes that's going to work in partnership with UFO disclosure because of this integral coupling between consciousness and uh, and the UFO subject. And, and people who have DMT or psilocybin experiences often have UFO experiences within that space or encounter greys or encounter flying saucers. And um, I, I agree with you that this flying saucer might be a time machine I also wonder if it is a machine that can traverse dimensions we don't really understand, like the dimension of thought, the dimension of consciousness, the realm of of, of thought. Uh, you know, this is one of those ideas that's put out there that it can travel from point to point because it's going beyond the speed of light. It's going at the speed of thought, and uh, right. it's a it's a curious thing, man. But this is this is the big elephant in the room: the consciousness equation and and how to solve it. Hey everyone, I'm sorry to interrupt what I imagine is a really interesting conversation. I just wanted to let you know about Project Unity's new merchandise store, where you can find a selection of clothing from hoodies and t-shirts to hats and even a duffel bag. You can also grab stickers, coffee mugs and more. It's a great way to help Project Unity grow and you get some stylish merchandise at the same time. You can also choose to support Project Unity via Patreon for as little as $4 a month, and this will give you access to our private Discord server, which has become a bustling social hub full of researchers and passionate people, a very friendly community, and we would love to see you become a part of it. You can also donate through PayPal if you like, and links to all of these can be found in the description box below. And of course, to help us in our battle against the YouTube algorithm, the best thing you can do is like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell to stay updated. And now, I'll let you get back to that fascinating talk. Enjoy. This is one of those ideas that's put out there that it can travel from point to point because it's going beyond the speed of light. It's going at the speed of thought. And uh, right. it's, a, it's a curious thing, man, but this is, this is the big elephant in the room, the consciousness equation and, and how to solve it. Yeah, and if, if speed of thought is faster than light the way that might happen is through quantum entanglement which is the only known thing that could potentially be nice. instantaneous and even be the light beam and there, there i've seen you know obviously until we understand the inner workings of the brain and how quantum consciousness would even work in a whole brain scenario absolutely it could have individual protons within dendrites that are entangled but how how we get the entire brain to be entangled it, unless that is, you know, the proton in some larger universal capacity. Um, but yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and you know, it's funny too. Some, I was trying to make notes as you were talking there because there were a couple of things I wanted to touch on. For instance, the drugs and UFO thing. You know, you, you said, I think, understanding the, the psychedelics will help us in this regard. We're both kind of iterating that. And it's funny because that's another thing that's been heavily stigmatized too. And and we're drugs have been taken away from us, yeah. especially ones that allow us to see deeper into this reality that yeah. that mm -hmm. is just behind the curtain. It could lift up the curtain and then Nixon and Reagan come along and say, No, oh no curtain for you. I think Graham Hancock would say that the war on drugs was the war on consciousness. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean it was it was clearly a, a countercultural war it was a war on on individuals who 
yeah, we're free thinking, we're anti-establishment, anti-war, obviously, a lot of those things that you feel when you experience that trip, you, you kind of instantly become a hippie, I guess. This just simply will not benefit the military industrial complex. So we can't help. No. We can't. No, absolutely not. N nor do educated people. Obviously. Right. I mean, that's that's why certain parties here try to take away education. They, they're anti-education, anti-woke, because woke people have things to say about the stupid shit they do. And not to make this a political thing, but, but you know, the, the fact that, that those so much go hand in hand and so much are removed from what we're allowed to talk about in, in this country and others, I think, is telling. And yeah, I absolutely agree, especially when we get into, you know, the DMT trips and and high dose psychedelics, LSD. Um, but, but, you know, I don't think that that's going to explain the UFO phenomenon, certainly not the nuts and bolts part, but it's clearly an important part of the consciousness aspect of that. And I, I completely agree that we need to keep an open mind at all. I think, unfortunately, it will be some time before that's possible because these laws do get re recapitulated over time and the, the stigmatizing mentality that keeps that going. Um, but as far as, you know, understanding what consciousness is, I think that's kind of a ways off too. But um, I, I consider myself a recovering materialist. I grew up as a biological anthropologist who studies these things that we can see, use statistics and, and hypothesis testing to try to figure out whether this model works or what's happening here. And obviously consciousness doesn't lend itself to that. It doesn't lend itself to the standards of evidence, nor does the UFO phenomenon. But I've kind of been coming around. It, we were talking earlier about this conference I attended in Esalen over the summer, and a lot of the conversation was about consciousness and, and how that's either manifested by the brain or what most people seem to be coming around to is that we're more of a, a transmitter and receiver. We're kind of an antenna. And that, that idea, as I learned at this conference and others recently, has, has been around for a very long time. A lot of Eastern mystics and spiritual leaders have articulated similar things. So Greece and ancient Egypt as well with hermetic yeah. and hermetic principles. It's been... Exactly. You know, yeah. So, you know, and, and, and that feels intuitive. Again, from a materialist standpoint, we can't test that yet, but it just, it feels right. You know, and especially when you pay attention to it, especially if you're sort of reflecting on the literature on, on psychedelic experiences and the hive mind and and just even, you know, communications with people on an interpersonal level, talking to empaths or being an empath or focusing on your dreams, you really get a sense that the consciousness is timeless and that we're just this physical entity that's somehow removed from it, but still able to tap into it on occasion. And, and the UFOs apparently provide us with some ability to do that or the individuals find them who have that. Uh, highly evolved hive mind and characteristic allow us in certain ways to transcend this fleshy meat bag thing we carry around with us that that prohibits us from doing such. But yeah, I do think in general we are moving toward that. And I, I think, you know, that, that gives me hope for the future. It's hard to have secrets or hatred for others if you all share the same consciousness. <laughs> Yeah, so it's a bit of a terrifying concept for a lot of people as well. I mean, you know, I'm not going to sit there and say that every single one of my thoughts is squeaky clean. So it's a, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, more, it's like Chris Rock always said, I ain't going to cheat because I'm going to get cut. Can't cheat. <laughs> you could no longer cheat if we have a hive mind. You know, you, if it, your partner knows the second you do that. You touched on something interesting, though, and something that I've talked about quite a bit, especially recently, and it's intuition. And, and obviously, intuition is a very ephemeral thing. It's hard to get hold of and kind of quantify and, and say, here, this is the process. But it's so often informed. It's acted as the initial kind of precursor for incredible developments in science and innovations and eureka moments and even even the the kind of fundamental architecture of reductionism and Newtonian atomism has kind of been informed by uh, intuitive inspiration from individuals like Newton or Rene Descartes who claimed he saw an angel when he was in a fever dream and the angel said to him if you want to understand the universe you must think in terms of measurement and number and he went on to found the basics of reductionism so there are so many different elements of intuition informing the scientific process, and then it's kind of thrown away as this woo-woo thing of, oh, you have a feeling about it, but really a feeling is quite a profound thing. And like you said, you have this feeling about it, that it's just the right thing. And 
I was I, I interrupted you briefly before just to say that this is an idea that's gone back all the way to you know the uh, the ancient Egyptians and Hermeticism and and the kind of old principles of the universe is mind and all is the universe as above so below this whole kind of concept of the macrocosm and the microcosm reflecting each other and so this is an intuitive narrative that's been echoed for thousands of years you know we're all connected we're all part of the one consciousness this whole thing and i think that it was i think it was david lynch is it david lynch the film director i think he actually did a really cool diagram of why intuitive mystics and and meditators get this information before scientists do and it was just this whole idea of the transcendental kind of cuts right through the atoms, through the quarks, through the you know, it goes straight to the source, and you get this very interesting direct line of intuitive information coming to you, which you can't prove. The scientists are like chipping away, chipping away at the bedrock of reality, like slowly getting down and breaking it into smaller and smaller pieces, and they're getting there. They're getting there slowly, especially with quantum mechanics becoming more prominent and computation we're getting there but the spiritualists the mystics the ones that go straight down to the kind of source of all knowledge you can't prove it but it's been echoed for thousands of years and you feel it you feel yeah. that there's some truth to it so i think that this is an interesting time because our technology our science it's getting closer to kind of meeting with that mystic perspective and maybe providing evidence for it and who knows what happens to humanity if we provide evidence for some of these kind of like spiritual underpinnings that we have in our in our society you know and it's not just in the spiritual or, or religious capacity that's obviously where so much of this comes from but I, I think it is all kind of tapping into the same thing to be honest because you hear the same uh same sorts of thoughts being articulated by musicians and authors and filmmakers and like I, i've written probably 45 or 50 songs in my life and you know you can't just sit down and write a song like you've got to kind of have this inspiration it's got to be the right mindset at the right time and then the whole thing just pours out you can write the melody lines the chords the lyrics all in like 10 minutes sometimes an entire song mm -hmm. and and i think it's the same thing you hear that described so often with authors i, I just got done uh reading eric wargo's book time loops which i highly recommend to people too and that is something that's testable. His precognition is actually testable, and he offers a number of ways to do that, and, and others have too. Prior to him, he expands on those, especially in the context of quantum mechanics and entanglement, which I think is important. But yeah, I mean, if if you have the ability to tap in there to get information that you can apply to industry or to write a story or to write a song or whatever, you know, you got to wonder, like with precognition, it's it's your own consciousness, it's your own experience. But if you're channeling something, where, where is that coming from? I, I think as far as dream precognition goes, and I've, I've had it my entire life, very intense dream precognition, conscious precognition on five different occasions, one relatively recent. But, but that almost seems like an aspect of your own future memories and this body on this planet that you will be a part of. And then eventually you do live them. I mean, you remember the dream sometimes decades before it actually happened. But when it talks, when, when, when you're talking about the creative process, I think it's almost tapping into something beyond that, not just your future and what you'll do. Obviously, that song will exist in your future, so you could be tapping into that. But I, I feel like it's different that there is, you know, this thing that exists beyond us where, where creativity and inspiration comes from. Maybe it's our collective future as a species. I don't know. But, you know, again, it's kind of a speculative this feels right kind of thing but when you feel it you definitely get the sense that it's not you per se who is doing this whatever you is whatever ego is but there's almost something more that there that that's coming from some place or, or some time that's that's really hard to pinpoint you know you know what's interesting about when when you feel it a lot of the time let's say if it's a piece of music and you you just feel it and you know you like you there's no real effort going into it whatsoever and you're just flowing and it just feels right what's interesting about those moments is that most other people agree like they'll listen to it and be like oh wow you know that was just that's a really incredible i can really feel the emotion in it so like you said it, there is something it's like you're infusing it with an energy with a signature that's uh, a little bit more than yeah human brain it's an interesting way of thinking of it because yeah. i've noticed that too i'll write a song that i sit down and try to write i have an idea 
and it's absolute shit. People are like, oh, that's the worst song I've ever heard, you know? But you're right. It's almost like you're going to make something happen. I'm going to make some music happen. That's when it works. That's when it flows together. That's interesting. No, I never thought about like that, that kind of blessing it or giving it that. I just always thought, you know, you're excited about it. You're doing it, but it is almost like a thing that, that has an energy unto itself. Um, and, yeah. I heard a, a podcast recently with the guy who supplied like 90% of the acid for, I forget his name. You might know his name, but like 90% of the acid. Why would I, people. Why would I might know his name? Why are you, why are you trying to that? <laughs> they sure. look like somebody who would know who I'm talking about, man. No, I'm kidding. But uh, um, it was it was really fascinating because, um, you know, they're, they're developing like, what's it called? 2, 2 CB or 2 BC, like a version of uh, like uh, ecstasy. No, a version of mescaline, I think. Anyway, getting uh, getting off track here. But what was interesting is that he was saying when they create these substances, they always try to make sure that they did it with with positive energy. They would meditate. They would kind of say a prayer almost because they felt, and there's a word for this. I probably should have listened to this more recently before I start talking about because I've clearly forgotten all of it. But there's a word for when you kind of imbue negative energy into these things and then it affects people's trips. And and I guess this is something that's been tested, not necessarily psychedelic drugs, but um, this sort of energetic aspect to materials that, that can be seen in these ways. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting to think about that creative process and how those, those things might be influenced by the energy of the experience at that time they're created too. Yeah. And I think for me, for me personally, the, the interesting correlation, um, as you can see, I am a, I'm a guitarist. So like for me, uh, like, and guitar has been something I've, I've played since I was like seven years old and there's a lot of guitarists in my family. So it seems to be like a DNA. Thing. I'm not quite sure what it is, but it's something in the genes. So I've always, uh, like, oh, right. that's a point of contention for me, but oh, yeah. Um, oh yeah. Why, why is that? <laughs> Cause I, I sucked at music and I worked my ass off to be able to do it, but my grandma, could go to church, come home, and then play the entire thing, the entire, not just one song she heard, but the entire service of music from memory. And she didn't know C from G on the piano. There was just something about when she put her hands down, played a couple notes. And so, of course, my whole family, who are largely music illiterate, were like, oh, you got your grandma's genes. I'm like, bullshit. Worked my ass off to be able to play this complicated ass instrument. You know, I didn't get nothing for free. <laughs> So, but with that said, yeah, I completely agree with you that, that music, but then you're separating nature and nurture. It's, it's yeah. more complicated yeah. on that, yeah. but, but you're right. There does seem to be kind of a propensity or predisposition to being able to make sense of music, but what else that's related to? I don't know. I think there's a number of cofactors there. I'm just bitter. For sure. No, it's funny. That's, that's kind of similar to me. I forget the names of chords. I can't remember the names of all the strings. I, I, but I can play it. <laughs> I can, I can play it. So you know, that's, that's always been one of those things, um, kind of growing up is, is playing the guitar. So when I get into a state with it, where I just slip out of thoughts and there's no real, I'm not thinking about what chords going next. And that's when I'm playing the best. That's when I'm playing at my mm -hmm. kind of top level. So it's just interesting that the kind of highest level of creative expression involves some level of autopilot of disassociation your, yeah like a disassociation yeah, yeah. absolutely back here and something else is doing the magic mm -hmm. and and you know nikola tesla he, he talked about this he has he has a great quote which you know goes something along the lines of there is a there is a core at the center of all things where we derive all of our inspiration all of our creativity and all of our innovation um i don't know where this core is i can't find the center of it but i know it exists and so it's this kind of acknowledgement that there is something else something a little weird and profound that seems to inspire humans you don't really know where it is you can't really put a coordinate on it but you just have this feeling that it exists and uh i think that's lacking from from science you know science scientists used to be really esoteric i mean there are still some, yeah, yeah science late 1800s especially with the right. society for psychical research and I, I'm kind of continuing the whole future human exploration thing, but taking a, a right turn, a sharp right turn in the way I'm approaching it. So the first book I've been told on multiple occasions is dense, where it's, uh, you know, if, if you're not familiar with the academic disciplines that are presented, then 
yeah, you got to look up some words. And that's why I've always recommended people get the audio book because, you know, I'm kind of explaining them. You don't have to stumble a, a, upon an esoteric word and have it derail the whole sentence for you. Um, but then the second book was more of a kind of a, a storytelling thing, looking at people's experiences and then pulling in that research and that scientific information in the context of what's happening to individual people across time and, and through space. And then this last book is is completely story. It's a satirical time travel scientific novel. But people that that follow the UFO phenomenon and especially this kind of time travel thing, I think will really enjoy it because it pulls in so much of the UFO phenomenon, specific cases, very subtly in the context of these characters and, and what they're working on and what their their mission is. But then also the science, it's being brought in too in the context of how they move abductees through walls and ceilings and you know what the light beam is and how they manipulate space time. All of these things that I presented in my first two books in different contexts, now it's in the context of a purely fictitious story that uh, from what my beta readers have said, I've had five beta readers so far, including a professor in world religions. And um, yeah, they've all been excited about it. And I've, I've actually become excited about it too. You know, when, when you're writing things like this, you're you're kind of like, well, this is different. You know, like Radiohead puts out a new album and everybody's like, screw you, this sucks. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't think that'll be the case. I feel like, like this complements the first two books. It's just obviously very, very different. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. it. Should be out. Um, I'm thinking probably April or May. So coming up. Nice. So have you got a Have you got a title? Yeah, it's called Revelation: The Future Human Past. Well, that's cool. Man. It ties in a lot of themes from history and science and UFOs and sex. Got to have sex. In but I have a little bit of sex sprinkled in. Got to. I mean, come on. Yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of like a, a half UFO treatment, half Fifty Shades of Grey type of situation <laughs> going on. Yeah, it's it pulls from a number of different genres for sure, but it, it was super fun to write, um, and I think people will enjoy it. Time will tell. That's cool, man. So when is this conference? When are you, when are you out in Ohio doing this conference? Uh, well, what's funny is everything I've been doing somewhat fortunately, because I live in the Pacific Northwest and most things tend to be in California or Arizona for some reason, which is a super easy flight for me. So all the TV shows I've done and conferences have just been boop, boop, I'm there. Uh, traveling east is harder, but that's also where I'm from. I was born and raised in Ohio, went to school in Ohio University in Athens in the south, at Ohio State in Columbus. In the middle of the state. So, yeah, I'm, I'm actually giving two talks in Ohio, which is nice. extremely odd. Um, one at the Ohio Heritage UFO Festival, which uh, I'm super excited about. Lots of great speakers. It's at right Patterson Air Force Base. Yeah, that's history. pretty cool, man. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think we're going to be like in the hangar with the alien bodies or anything, but Aww. we get enough of us, we can we can storm it, right? Yeah, you might be able to worry a 51 thing. You can overwhelm them. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It definitely went well for the Area 51. We <laughs> raid the paper shop. Whatever that oh, was. Oh, man, that thing was such a cringe <laughs> fest. Such a cringe fest. Oh, it was fun to watch, though. It was an outsider. It was fun to watch. It was funny. But no, it's it's within the gates. Actually, my cousin has worked at Rate Pat for decades. She's like She's been passing my book around to all of her coworkers at whatever that intelligence agency is there, so... Yeah, I'm I'm super excited about that. And then the other one is in August, uh, the MUFON International Symposium, like August 25th, I think. And um, again, lots of great speakers. I thought it'd be fun to, as a biological anthropologist, to organize some sort of tour of the Creation Museum. They've got like a Noah's Ark reconstruction just outside of the city. And just to go in there with all of our heresy and our irreverency, just to... <laughs> So that's a let, lot of work. Let them have their dream. Let them have their dream. Yes. It's have their belief system, that, that's fine. They can believe what they want. Absolutely. And who knows, if Carl Jung's right, then your reality just reconfigures to accommodate for your belief system. So they may <laughs> be in their own dimensional gym. They're, they're right in their space. They're right. Good, in their space. good on them. 
Good on them. Yeah. I, you know, I was recently, I just got back from LA. I was at the, uh, at the conscious life expo that was kicking off. Oh yeah. I saw a bunch of pictures from that. It looked great. Yeah. It was a big event. I mean, my God, there was thousands of people there. Um, yeah. a lot, a lot of people. It was pretty overwhelming for me. It was a, a heavy dose of the, of the California new age spiritual. Uh, you know, like I'm, I'm a, I'm genuinely a spiritual guy. Like I don't have a, 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 a like a specific belief. But because of my experiences, I do believe that there's something beyond the body with consciousness. And I'm, I'm very open to it. But yeah, there's some intense uh, kind of personalities at that place. There were some really interesting speakers. But yeah, you also get just uh, some of uh, some of the finest examples of. Yeah, I mean that's kind of the heart of kind of uh, that movement, right? Say again. That's kind of the heart of the movement, and that I mean, at least in the U.S., obviously, it's not as far as the world and time, but I can't think of anywhere else in this country where that would be a better place for something like that. Oh yeah. No, for sure. For sure. It was a cool experience. It was a cool experience. I'm still, I'm yeah, still jet lagged. I'm still jet lagged. Like I'm not sleeping properly whatsoever. It's crazy. Um, it's a, it's an eight, it's eight hour difference and nine, I think, cause you and me are eight hours eight in there and I was whatever it yeah. is messing with my head man and i can't sleep properly that's why i scheduled this for later on in the evening because it's 10 we start at 10 p.m my time but for me i'm kind of waking up <laughs> right now I'm like stuck in a highlight zone right now so yeah it needs to adjust and settle back but it was a cool experience. first time in la i've never been to la before so it was a pretty cool uh it's a cool town yeah i've got i've been there like six times in the last three years have you never been before? The first time I was actually having anxiety dreams about earthquakes and traffic and people. So I, li- I live in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's a very sparsely populated area, but no, I've come to love it. I really love LA. I've gotten to check out a lot of the different neighborhoods and the people there are so nice. It's crazy. You think they're all really mean people because there's so many of them, but it's the opposite. It's like, it's like where I live in Butte, Montana. Everyone's just genuinely nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's something I noticed as well. I think I think the uh, the issue for the UK is we just don't get enough sunshine. They're happier out there because they've got sunshine. We don't get it. We've, we've just got clouds and, and rain, so everyone's miserable. Yeah, that could be a factor. There's no doubt that the yeah. sunshine affects your mood. And, you know, I wonder if it's, if there's more than that too, if it's, if it's the, because I've started to think that light is maybe related to consciousness in some way. Um, not to circle back on that because we, we talked about it a good amount. But I don't know, like you, you just hear so much and like Eastern mystics and Kundalini and like the words that we have, like enlightenment, you know, it just almost seems that, that, that light is somehow involved in, and maybe in that transference process where we're the antenna absorbing and sending and receiving and, you know, and, and light for a photon, it is timeless because everything is relative to that. So maybe that would help explain the, the, the timeless aspect of consciousness too, if, if it is somehow related to that electromagnetic spectrum. It's it's not something I've, I've researched a lot. It's just something that kind of grew out of some conversations I had recently. And I don't know, can't help but wonder. Well, I think, it's, I think that's an interesting insight because, you know, light is photons and photons, the force carrier for electromagnetism. And we are bioelectromagnetic creatures. We produce electromagnetism. Our heart, our brain, our heart produces yeah. a very powerful electromagnetic field. It does, yeah. It extends around our body. So I kind of look at it like you've got this electromagnetic field around you that you're producing. You're also immersed in an ocean of electromagnetism. Mm-hmm. And if photons, like I said, are the force carrier for that energy. Then yeah, they play a huge role in in this uh, this phenomena because I do think that electromagnetism plays a, a very key role in non-local quantum kind of spooky action at a distance behavior with humans. I think it's in some way we're able to navigate through the networks of electromagnetism, kind of move your awareness through these networks, and then return back yeah. to old perception. So it's interesting that you say that, and I mean, this is just kind of another obscure thought, but I have this, had this idea that if you imagine the human being as a little bubbled off, uh, ball of electromagnetism, you could almost look at that as a particle, like a photon and, uh, you know, the whole double split experiment where if you're not observing the photon, it becomes a wave of energy. When you are observing the photon, it becomes a particle of energy. 
So you could almost imagine that the human being right now, as we are right now, we're in our collapsed particle form, this little ball of electromagnetic energy. But when you get into meditative processes or you affect the default consciousness perception with psychedelics or whatever you do to initiate some sort of perceptual shift, this could almost be seen as you going from this to this and spreading out and your perception spreads out to this non-local capability. Um, so it's almost like the human being could be seen as a, you know, collapsed or wave function particle, a bit like the whole photon dual uh, double split experiment thing. So yeah, sorry, you've sent me off on a on a on a fo photon consciousness. Oh no, I I completely agree. Actually, I've been thinking about it in in those yeah. exact terms recently, and and especially you know after reading Eric's book Time Loops, it's he talks about that a lot, and it's um make a note of that book yeah you should it's it's a really it's you know it's dense like people say my first book was especially those first the first like third of it that really dive in deep to the quantum mechanics and and consciousness and thought but yeah no, i i i don't know you know it's one of those things that's going to be hard to figure out but i feel like we're inching closer i, I kind of feel like it's going to start with our understanding of the the little things the quantum world and then expand but you know and maybe it'll come when we get that theory of quantum gravity because you know when you understand the waves the gravity the electromagnetic spectrum but then the small bits and the, the realm of quantum mechanics it almost seems like those are the same thing that we're talking about with with time travel and, and all of these limitations of understanding how that works where, where once we get to that point where we have this theory that combines general relativity with quantum mechanics you know it almost seems like it'll be the singularity of understanding where it opens up our minds to all of these different things in our physical reality with our consciousness with thoughts with uh with that, all of it i don't know uh, and I, honestly i think it could happen in our lifetimes so i really do i don't think we're far from that no nope, me neither it's a really weird one that i've been kind of grappling with for the past couple of years and going back to intuition and going back to feeling like just having this feeling although it's certainly i guess informed and, and and biased by observing the world through the lens that we observe the world which is looking at all of the weird shit that's going on so you know you're constantly kind of going oh my god like this is happening this is happening this is happening but a lot is happening there is a huge acceleration in kind of like technological development and innovation yeah. and geopolitical instability and just kind of like financial issues and crises and developments like there's just so much in different sectors both good and bad or like the dissolution of a system and the you know rebuilding of a new one etc cetera, etc cetera. so we're going from some sort of really weird time right now and i just have the feeling i just have the feeling we're on the edge we're on the edge of something not quite sure what it is and i was speaking to my friend mikai morin who's a guest of the podcast he's been on a couple of times and one of his things was that he was uh, trying to get the deep tech sectors to understand the dangers and the risks of hyper automation and advanced artificial intelligence and you know the fact that these things are going to very quickly take over society and, and yeah. people to be displaced in terms of jobs and you know he was warning about that for a long time but he truly believes and we talked about this the last time he came on um that he he truly believes we're coming into a singularity like you just said some sort of ai derived singularity in that I don't know if you've looked much at what's happening with AI. I have, yeah, no, I, I, I definitely think, um, you know, and and I, most people do use the term singularity in the context of the AI singularity, but yeah. you know, maybe maybe they're all the same one. As right. the singularity is not something you can escape from. It pulls everything in. It has infinite mass and density. So, yeah, I mean, maybe that's the tip of the singularity, as if a imagined round ball of an event horizon can have a tip but yeah it does seem like we're moving towards some transformational transmutational space and and everybody i talk to seems to feel that everybody that's paying attention seems to feel that so and i, and I don't see it as as bad per se metamorphosis or something yeah some sort of cocoon and re-emergence but obviously it's going to be disruptive people don't like disruptions uh but it doesn't necessarily mean that the disruption's bad. You can come out as a beautiful butterfly as, you know, previously a, a gross caterpillar, although I like caterpillars too. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see, but you, you talk about this with people that aren't really paying attention or in the space and they're like, oh, you know, it's World War Three. we're all going to die. 
that's what the mainstream media is feeding us is that we're all going to die. It's all terrible, but I, I see it differently. I'm not feeling that, you know, going back to the feels, we got the feels, man. I'm glad to hear you do too. Cause it doesn't feel like that. It feels like something and transformational, not destructive. Yeah. And like, you know, that whole caterpillar butterfly analogy is not a bad one because the, the, the process of metamorphosis for a caterpillar is a inherently destructive process in, in it's broken down basically to its most basic components and then rebuilt into this new completely different type of creature and so you, know, you look at the state of the world like we just highlighted and there's all of this instability and kind of breaking down our systems certainly feels like a metamorphosis process it's not the end it's just the end of something and the beginning of something else and uh, and i do think ai is gonna have an impact and i do think technology and 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 uh, physics in general energy generation yeah i i really really would love for this to go in an optimistic way and for these things to not just be looked at as national security assets or defensive assets and that they can be you know for actual applications for the world we're we're on the edge man so yeah well we'll keep this in mind you know it doesn't really matter what any of these government entities think they're they're not ushering in something they made up they're ushering in something that is real and what i've come to believe is benevolent and positive and so that thing brings itself into this space as a beacon of light so to speak it, no matter how we try to conceptualize or fight over the details or whatever government botches the the pr presentation of this thing that thing innately remains itself and it remains what i've come to understand as a, a positive force so so yeah i don't think it really matters and, and maybe that's a part of my perhaps naive positivity about it but i I don't know. I, I think it's going to be fine. And especially because what what's coming is coming from a place that is better than us. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I certainly think it's better than being unnecessarily terrified. Right. And then, <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Or terrifying because we're arguably quite terrifying in, in this time and space. Very true. Right? We're, a, we're an interesting species, but we're a young species, man. Like at least in terms of this particular evolutionary cycle, I don't, I don't know if we've been to this level before and, you know, cataclysmic events have wiped us back to zero and now we're starting again. But at least in this iteration, we're still a young species and we, you know, we, we exhibit the characteristics of a, of a young species. If you think of the humans as a, a single collective uh, individual, I mean, we're basically kind of like a teenager right we don't really like sharing we have territorial conflicts like this is all yeah. very teenage angsty kind of behavior really i like that we're, we're like a super organism going through puberty basically dude i think that's what we are right we're a super organism going through puberty that's <laughs> i like that <laughs> that's your stuff man i just put a word to it for me when i got into this subject it was truly off of the back of feeling this was benevolent and like you i don't know maybe i'm being misguided or naive but i i feel deep down that this isn't a this is a benevolent thing so uh yeah we'll just have to see where it goes man but this has been a really cool conversation really enjoyed catching up with you like i said it's been a little bit of time since we caught yeah, up absolutely in, in that time you've grown this fantastic beard um, you know, you're, you're, you're truly, <laughs> truly kind of like embodying the, the mountain man image now. And, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a great, well, it's temporary. Like I said, it's just to keep my face warm on the ski sleeps, face, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. Once it, once it gets warm, awesome. this, this thing's coming off. I actually don't like having a beard. I, I feel like I, I look kind of Amish to be honest. I grew up <laughs> with Amish people and in Ohio, there's nothing wrong with that, but my heritage is Welsh. So. Oh, isn't I feel it? like it's it's cultural appropriation here to be rocking an Amish beard, but it's functional. That's what I'm saying. It's functional, not uh, stylistic. Do we in shout out Kumraik? <laughs> do you speak Welsh? Oh, God. It's been so long, man. I used to go to these Welsh conventions because we all, our ancestors all landed in southern Ohio to work in the coal mines down there. And, and we used to get these massive, like, mega churches basically and sing hymns and Welsh and well, the stuff a Welsh flag I got from when I was like eight years old at one of these things hanging in my office but no I have a little book called like Chimru the Dragon or something Chimru <laughs> yeah that's how do you say it come on correct me Chimru 
Cymru. Cymru. Really? Yeah, there's the, it, it's cum, like C-Y-M, so it's cum. And then the R-U is you got to roll the R, so it's Cymru. 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 Oh, yeah, I butchered that. <laughs> so, <laughs> my ancestors are rolling in their grave. I, I, when you come into Wales, you'll see the sign that says, Welcome to Wales, which is Croatia e Cymru. And I know that because mm-hmm. I'm half Welsh, I'm half Welsh. I grew up in North Wales. Uh, oh, cool. The, my mum's side of my family's Welsh. And uh, it's a beautiful country, man. You know, I didn't appreciate it as yeah. when I was younger, when I was younger and going to school. The whole body died. Like, back. Oh, man. Like the, the valleys, the, the, the mountains, the forests. It's just, it's just pretty striking you know it's where tolkien got what was inspiration for the uh for the oh, elves it? stuff like that yeah um that's cool little little bit of nerd trivia for you so in in the lord of the rings series when the elves are speaking elvish there's quite a few of the words that are just legitimate welsh words so he used a lot oh, that's sweet. Uh, the welsh language yes yeah, affinity for it but yeah it's a beautiful country have you actually been to wales I am the only one of my family that hasn't been. And what's funny is pilgrimage, brother, make the pill. Well, we're 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 actually going to in April. We're going to start in Paris, then go up to London, and then over to Wales. But we we decided to go south instead. So we're going south from Paris through the Dordogne Valley, and and then into Spain. Uh, so it didn't work out. But yeah, it, it's on the list for sure. I mean, uh, it's I'm gonna have to make it there before I die. It's obligatory. Oh, for sure. My for ancestral sure. homeland. But yeah, all, all my sisters have been there and they loved it. Yeah, yeah. No, you should totally go. And if you do, I would recommend going to North Wales. Not not just because I grew up there, so I'm biased, but it is genuinely the more rural uh, area of Wales. You've got snow. Yeah. That's what we were seeing. Because we did a bunch of research. That that was legit where we were going for a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was the plan. Yeah, yeah. Snowdonia. Snowdonia. The, the, the mountain. Snowdonia. Snowdonia. Um, that that's just striking. I mean, it's the, it's the tallest mountain in Wales, Snowdon. Um, so it's an, it's an incredible mountain to trek up if you've got the if you've got the legs for it. If not, there's actually a train that takes you up to the top, so you can cheat if you want to cheat. Oh, um, I'm a cheater. You're a cheater. No worries. There's even a gap. Yeah, I'm not a cheater. I don't take well, trains, man. Not a cheater. I hiked up a mountain in uh in Interlock in Switzerland once, and I got to the top. I was like, where the fuck do these people come from? Uh, it turns out there was a train. There's a train. I, I still would have hiked it. It, it was a beautiful you. hike. Good for you. Well, if you want a good hike, um, it depends on how, how confident you feel, but if you want a good climb up... up, up, up I, I live in Montana, man. No. I'm surrounded by mountains. I'm up in these bitches all the time. All right, you got to hit up Kribgoch. Kribgoch, which is C-R-I-B-G-O-C-H. Kribgoch. And that's kind of like the... It's a it's a root of Snowden, which is like a spine. It's like the spinal root. Of the so you've got some pretty, you know, jagged. You're speaking my language, yeah. You know, you've got to you got to know your shit a little bit, especially if you go there in the winter. But in the summertime, oh my god, the views are incredible. So um, yeah, couldn't recommend it enough. If you end up in North Wales, go to Snowdonia, check out that region. Perfect. Yeah, thanks, man. Appreciate that. No worries. Hey, and if you're swinging by the area, I'm sure my mum would happily give you a cup of tea and uh, <laughs> even a hot dinner if you're lucky. Awesome. That sounds great. I'll, I'll hit you up before it happens, that's for sure. 